Hi, this is Ken Burnside from Ad Astra Games, and I'm here with Mike Lanesa. Say hi, Mike. And with Daniel Cast of uh, Majestic 12 Games. Say hi, Dan. Hello. Alrighty. Uh, we are going to be doing a playthrough of the third tutorial scenario for Squadron Strike Traveler. Dan has played Squadron Strike and knows a little bit about Traveler, but he hasn't seen Squadron Strike Traveler yet. And honestly, a lot of people haven't seen Squadron Strike Traveler yet. But Dan is going to be here to ask questions about why is doing that and remind Mike and I that we need to actually explain some things about the game as we go along. Uh, Mike has a little bit of information about Traveler. He's going to prepare for the rest of us, and uh, we're going to hand the uh, we're going to hand everything off to Mike. Hi, folks. If you're uh, looking at my screen, you're seeing TravelerMap.com zoomed out to show uh, the whole setting. In the in the middle is the Third Imperium. This is our uh, essentially the protagonist and of the setting and where most of the written adventures take place are from the Imperial point of view. Over here towards Spinwards, as I drag and zoom in, we look, we, we, see, uh, we see neighbor, the Zodani Consulate. And the Zodani are also humans, they're just uh, humans with uh, higher propensity for psionics, right? Yes, that uh, does create an extensive cultural clash and it's one of the main conflicts explored in the game. Mm -hmm. And specifically, they have this border right here, the Imperium in red and the Zodani Consulate in blue, where where they bu bump heads semi-regularly. Uh, the spin word... This slowly slowly uh, fills it in. Each of those little dots is a world detailed in the setting, working on, on developing a setting si since the mid-1970s. Mm -hmm. So about 40 yeah. years of stuff. About the oldest published setting in uh, in gaming. Mm -hmm. Spinward Warches are where the Frontier Wars happen. And we are right now in the middle of the Fifth Frontier War. Okay. Which lies between, on the right of the screen, the, ma the main body of the uh, Imperial Territories, and off on the left, the Five Sisters. Mm -hmm. up, to, up to the north, the Sword Worlders are aligned with the Zodani, and the Adarians are... Neutral to uh, Zodani aligned. All right. And all, the, and all this is a vast scope for for uh, commerce warfare on an interstellar scale, trying to isolate. So, and Mike, cut obviously, out. some yes, some people are going to have more or less familiarity with the Traveler setting. It's been around forever, and it's one of the most played in and, and famous, frankly, systems out there. What makes it so well suited to a squadron strike setting? What, what, why are we here? Why we're here is because the sort of commerce warfare, the guerre de course, that creates some of the most uh, interesting small, small scale actions, small enough to be uh, re readily gameable, happens okay. in this, this section of space. Mm -hmm. And also, reinforcements. and also, Traveler has had uh, numerous space combat games, not all of which have been terribly fun to play. So we're trying, so we're trying to to very much bring uh, the the fun to uh, space space combat in the, in this setting. And as I was developing scenarios, District Two Six Eight leapt out at me as the place where the actions of a single uh, ship or a small squadron can have a dramatic effect. Mm -hmm. One captain, one escort, and their opponents. So I'm going to cut you off here for my. Uh, I'm going to cut you off here, Mike, because I'm going to walk through the the scenarios that uh, are going to be part of the Squadron Strike Traveler tutorial. This is the third. This is the third tutorial scenario. Uh, I tend to believe in sort of an old school methodology of teaching games, which is that a game publisher should go and put in the tutorial scenarios that teach the rules of the game in stages, because in a lot of cases, somebody is new to all of this, and they don't know what vector movement is actually like, or they've never actually played a game on a hex grid, um, and they don't know the Traveler universe that well. So we're trying to actually just you know bring it to them in small, little bite-sized chunks. On the tutorial setup, we have a protagonist character who is part of the fictional vignettes that I use to lead into all of the scenarios. Uh, he has so far managed to survive the first two scenarios, and, uh, and actually has managed to survive the first three scenarios, and I'm writing his uh, consequences into the beginning of scenario four. And he starts out with a one-on-one -on -one duel with a P.F. Sloan uh, frigate versus a 
Judiac Heavy Destroyer. After literally escaping with that one by the skin of his teeth, uh, he had one SI box left when he left that fight, and before he could actually get anything significantly repaired, he got pounced by a LCL Destroyer uh, run by the Oslan Hiring. And that one was a scenario where the large part of how to win was to make sure that you had a way to get out of the fight. Learning in scenario three, then. So in scenario three, our captain has managed to survive uh, the first two scenarios. He has been uh, told that the ship that he had gotten through those two first two scenarios was going to be scrapped because there really wasn't much of it left to actually fix. And he got promoted to being a destroyer escort squadron commander, which is why Mike is driving three ships and I am driving the ships that they were playing hide and seek with. At this particular point in the in, count, in, the, in the timeline, the Jordani have started the Fifth Frontier War, and the Third Imperium is just starting to figure out that they're actually in a war because of the Traveler time communication problem. Uh, in Traveler news, only travels at the speed of the fastest ships. So you can get a lot of things like the historical account of the Battle of New Orleans, where you don't realize that you're in a war until you know the war has actually been going on for a month or two. Or longer in this case. The Battle of New Orleans was fought uh, after the peace treaty had been signed, but nobody had heard yet. Right. And that can also happen in Traveler. So in this particular case, our captain, uh, our protagonist, uh, has been given command of a flotilla, and he was nominally assigned to be the escorts for the for an Ajanti High Lightning class cruiser, uh, which is known as which is actually the canonical Loathsome Refractor. No, I didn't name it. It's actually one of the ones from the Traveler wiki. And the Ajanti High Lightning is designed to sort of be the camel of the Traveler universe. It was a uh, mouse designed by government committee. It has a little bit of everything. It has a gigantic, it has a gigantic uh, spinal mount. It has missiles. It has fighters. It has lasers. It has jump five and a lot of fuel to do, to do that. So it can go and do across the border deep jump raids. And it maneuvers poorly. The person who has been assigned command of the Loathsome Refractor is a Traveler Noble who has primarily been using her command of that ship as having a really cool place to go and have dinner parties. She really resents the fact that there's a war on and she has to actually cancel, cancel her social engagements. Her flag captain is a student of an older style of doctrine and has basically sent the three uh, escorts that would normally be flying in formation with her and keeping her safe from missiles uh, out into the various system to act as beaters, to go and find where those Jordani are refueling. Unfortunately for Mike, playing the Imperials, they have found where those Jordani are refueling. In the first, you single ships? The first two scenarios were all, sh were all single ships. This is, teaching how to use, this is teaching how to do multiple ships on each side. It's going to introduce aggressive targeting restrictions which are a rule that are part of Squadron Strike, to make sure that the obvious tactic of, oh, it's different, kill it first, has at least some flies in the ointment to make it a little bit more complicated. Uh, it'll also be introducing the Misan Gun in the rules. Uh, the Misan Gun is the terror weapon of the Traveler universe, uh, at least until Misan screens are developed, at which point it becomes a merely horrifying weapon, as opposed to a, <gasps> you did what? <laughs> so I'm going to show off my SSD for a little bit. Dan, can you see this okay? Yes, I can see it. Okay, thanks. So this is going to be a walkthrough of a Squadron Strike SSD, and it's going to be a walkthrough of a few things that are part of the Traveler nomenclature. A standard Squadron Strike SSD is sort of red from left to right. All of your defenses are over here on the left side, where I'm waving my mouse cursor around. Uh, the next band over here has the hit location tables, which are also with all the little checkboxes that define what your systems can do can live. Now, some of the Traveler Grand Yards are already looking at this and going, wait, what are those bubbles over there on the nose of the ship and on the aft of the ship, and why are those little shield icons there? Those bubbles, uh, we're using the Squadron Strike Ablative Shield mechanic to handle sandcasters, because this vastly simplifies many of the things with sandcasters in the game. And, well, hey, we're continuing a long-standing tradition of every edition of Traveler Space Combat has a different way of handling sandcasters. In Squadron Strike, every one of these belts of six sand costs a unit of sandcaster ammunition. Uh, on the nose of this particular light cruiser, the Shadavidlitz, uh, I have uh, two boxes of uh, sandcaster ammunition, and each of those boxes has four units of ammo. And so whenever I turn on six shield bubbles, I burn off one quarter of a box. So this thing can pretty much survive for about four turns 
of continuous fire with the sand that it has. It probably isn't going to live that much longer uh, if it gets into a close engagement. Over in this part of the ship, uh, where I'm moving my cursor, we have the weapon mounts, which describe what weapons are in the mount. Uh, this says Spinal Mison TL-14. Uh, it has an infinite number of shots. Uh, down here where there's the diamond here in the, light, in the dark, in the medium gray background, that says that it takes two of my four action points to fire that Nissan gun. And this little box with a circle cut out in the middle of it means that it takes one turn to, for the uh, Nissan gun to cool off before it can shoot again. For the Jadavid Litz, that's because this is literally the smallest cruiser that has a Nissan gun, a spinal Nissan in it in the setting. And in order to make it fit in Squadron Strike, I kind of had to discuss all of the engineering compromises that you had from building your ship around a gigantic keel-mounted weapon. TL is a turret laser. Uh, TE is a turret energy beam. Uh, I have these on the right side and the left side of the ship. And on the aft, I have a, tri I have a trio of turret lasers that cover the bottom of the ship. And also I have a bay particle beam uh, that also requires a single action point to fire. And note that it doesn't have an overlapping firing arc with the uh, Spinal Nissan gun, although they're close. My primary long-range weapon is the Spinal Nissan gun. Here, These are the weapon tables that I've got here. Uh, the Spinal Nissan gun fires twice in a turn whenever it fires, so every other turn it fires twice. Uh, it has a number of weapon traits. Uh, two times hits SI means that every damage point that gets to SI marks off two SI boxes. The SI track is down here. When you run through the end of the SI track, the ship has gone boom. Uh, it has ignores component armor. It has no blow through. Uh, it has a weapon trait called chain fire. With chain fire, if you hit with the first shot on a multi, on a multi rate of fire weapon, all subsequent shots will you know, will also hit. Uh, this makes this weapon particularly dangerous. And lastly, we have the mison trait. The mison trait means that when a spinal mison gun hits, it ignores the sand and it ignores the armor on the ship. For all intents and purposes, because the Jadavid Litz doesn't actually have a Mison screen, if two Jadavid Litzes fired on one another, they would ignore one another's defenses and do horrific damage to, and do horrific damage as they uh, slaughtered each other with impunity. Any questions? Nothing mechanically. I'm curious how much of this already built into the Squadron Strike uh, engine and how much of it you had to create in order to simulate this particular setting. The only thing that I really had to add for this setting I had to create burst mode shielding for the sandcasters, and pretty much what happens is when I make Traveler, uh, it just changes burst mode shielding ammunition to sandcaster ammunition, and that's the only change. Uh, the other thing that I had to do was I had to put in a special rule about the Mison trait, uh, because Squadron Strike doesn't actually have a ignore all your opponent's defenses uh, weapon trait, because if it did in a competitive campaign, it would be the first trait that everybody took. And if you take a look at the Bay Particle Beam down here, uh, the Bay Particle Beam also has two times hits SI, and it has no blow through, and it has the Bursting Trait, which, since you've played through the Empire Directorate War, you know what the Bursting Trait does. Bad, terrible things. Badly, yeah. <laughs> so no blow through, which is on both of the Particle Beam and the Mison, means that when damage comes in and it hits one of these end, and it hits one of these end caps that goes to SI, any damage that doesn't convert to SI damage continues to wrap around onto the next hit location. And it will keep on doing so until it actually wraps through three SI hits. I've actually seen in different settings some of these things actually go through three SI, three SI end caps. Uh, the last one we have down here that we need to think about is on the turret energy beams. The turret energy beams have splash. Do you, have you played in a setting where splash has existed yet? I have not. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm going to move my microphones so you may hear some extraneous. Alrighty. Not a problem. Uh, is that any better? That's a little bit better. Um, so, okay. s with splash damage, once weapon, once the damage gets past the uh, defenses and the armor, the uh, sand and the armor over here, uh, you roll a hit location and you take whatever damage is left and apply it to that hit location and the two adjacent hit locations. So, if I hit six points to the six points of splash damage to hit location five, I do six points to five, I do six points to four, and I do six points to six. I just said, let's make that one go away. I'm not, I'm not a big fan of that. <laughs> uh, you're, you're not a fan of the other guy having that, and you not. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> All of the fun stuff, because I never, ever get the ships with the fun stuff. 
Uh, so that's a brief overview of my SSDs uh, for my big ship. Uh, my ship also has two of these little uh, Vlegdatl escorts, and because of the way the Traveler has accrued and accumulated things over the course of 40 years, this is technically a cruiser. I'm waiting for the dumbfounded sound to come out of Dan uh, to come out of Dan's microphone. <laughs> Sorry, I'm muting it when I'm not actively talking to you, but trust me, the sound was there. <laughs> well, it does fill the the uh, cruise role. It's it's got enough endurance to go out and patrol the space lanes for a bit before it has to come back and uh, refuel and resupply. But it's a really small ship. Yeah. The, that is a 2,500 ton ship, and that really small light cruiser is at 14,000. Mm -hmm. Well, at least you have a decent to call it a scout. So, my Vlegdaddles have a bay particle beam that has been crammed onto the ship by the expedient of giving it a one window, uh, a one window firing arc. And they have a trio of turret lasers. In. Uh, in, in the early days of Traveler, everything was adventurer scale, and the entire game was built around the idea that player characters might have a 100 to 200 to 400 ton ship. And if you needed to make the player characters wet their pants, you, you went and you put a 1,200 ton ship in the neighborhood, or a 2,500 ton uh, ship in the neighborhood. And then somewhere in the development process, Traveler came out with uh, Shipbook 9 is what it's called, Mike, right? Uh, Supplement 9, Fighting Ships of the Imperium. Yes. Um, so, in the early days, this was a perfectly legitimate cruiser. And then uh, Supplement 9 came on out, and we got what is called Big Ship Traveler, where a cruiser is somewhere in the vicinity of 40,000 to 50,000 tons, and battleships are 200,000 200, displacement tons. So, this is something of a relic. Substantially bigger. Yes. <laughs> yes, this is one of the challenges of doing... Tra of doing space combat in Traveler, is that you really effectively have two game scales. And you have a couple of ships that are going to coexist in both game scales. We're planning on doing an adventurer ship uh, supplement for Squadron Strike after we get a little bit further down the product line, um, where this ship is going to get redesigned, and it's going to get redesigned as something in the vicinity of about... S it's going to be redesigned as something in the vicinity of, you know, SI-20... Sorry, of SI-14 to 15... Uh, and the 5,000 ton PF Sloan that uh, Mike is driving would probably be about an SI-22. The actual, honest to God, uh, Vlegdaddle that I've got here that's 14,000 tons would be treated as an SI would be treated as a capital ship on that scale. With Traveler, you end up effectively having two ship scales because the big ship navy wouldn't even notice a player character ship because it might not actually have enough mass to register on the detectors. <laughs> Oops, we accidentally blew it out of the. Sky. Guy, because somebody put their coffee mug down and made a key vibrate. <laughs> it triggered the anti anti meteorite defense defense uh, sensor. Total non sequitur here, but something's yeah, bugging yeah. me. Didn't P. F. Sloan write Eve of Destruction? I have no idea so where the ship named after a songwriter. Mm, I think we might. Uh, I have no idea where Traveler got the name P. F. Sloan, but it's been in the game for quite some time. Uh, okay. Mike, yeah. do you have any insight on it? Was the the, the, uh, the writer for Barry Maguire's Eve of Destruction back in the sixth? Uh, confirm. Okay, I had no idea if they were related or not. The song's from 1965, so uh, technically, yes. There actually there there could have been an influence there. You know, we also have things like aircraft carriers named after Carl Vinson. Who uh, admit, admittedly uh, helped uh, reorganize and uh, f and fund the Navy of the early uh, Cold War? Mm -hmm. uh, I don't really approve of naming capital ships after politicians, but if you're going to, that was a good pick. Mm -hmm. uh, and just so we can take a look at the point costs on these, my ships are 82 and 30 and 30, so I'm at about 142 points. And Mike's ships are uh, 45 points apiece. This is assuming that our uh, crew rates are all you know, matched up appropriately. We're going to switch on over to the virtual tabletop in just a little bit here. But what this means is that in theory, on points, this is an even match, or pretty close to it. Uh, in practice, 
because of the nature of the horrifying weapons and the lack of the appropriate defense for it, I have a bit of an advantage on this. And again, as I said, on this particular setup on the scenario, this is one of those, oh dear, we actually found them. Crap. <laughs> yeah, keeping in mind that the actual cruiser that, we're, that my forces are scouting for out, outweighs the... Outweighs the entire fight, you know, two and a half to one. If the if the loathsome refractor were actually here, well, there'd be an interesting. Uh, th th this might actually be a more interesting fight. Not for the Zodani. That's that's a clear cut case of a scatter the squadron, and someone try and get a report back. Mm -hmm. My ships are Zodani, and you'll notice that they all have uh, names that are reminiscent of Polish, in the midst of an allergy in, in the midst of an allergy attack. With the mostly the mostly uh, Valani names on the uh, Imperial side, not much better. Not much better. Uh, we have put the crew rates of the ships in uh, square brackets at the end of each of the ships' names because that makes it a little bit easier to remember when we're making crew rate checks and the like what we have to actually beat. So I'm about ready to begin. Dan, do you have any questions? So far. Okay. So we are on the start of turn one. Uh, we have a record here that is telling us uh, chocolate carts uh, five seventy. That is. A, pardon me, that is a database derived uh, timestamp so that nobody has to read off a 10 digit number to make sure we've properly synchronized. I'm going to force a synchronization here by pushing this button. And that will give us an updated timestamp as it uh, round trips everything to the database and back. We're now on gray juice. Oh, that's oh so appealing. <laughs> yes, 503 here. Mm -hmm. And now we're in the pre plotting phase. So, the virtual tabletop actually walks you through the entire traveler, not the entire traveler, the entire squadron strike sequence of play. Uh, we're in the we're in the pre-plotting phase where we're basically going to go through and generate our action points. So I've got four on my cruiser and two on each of my uh, other cruisers. We're going to call them cruisers because it keeps morale up. Uh, we don't have to spend any action points for cooling weapons. Uh, we do need to make some crew rate checks for aggressive fire. And Mike, this is a new feature for you, I think. Uh, I'm going to go through and, on arcs, make sure that I have selected a ship. Uh, I have the Nieberfriv Delejma, which has a crew rate of 6+. plus. I'm going to make a crew rate check. And that is going to go on up, and I failed that crew rate check. Uh, the next ship is the uh, Etzia Fazer Stavrons, and I'm going to make a crew rate check. But I failed that one, too. I need to roll a six or higher on this ten-sided die that the computer is rolling for me. And finally, on the uh, Davil Jorter Hal Low, I need to roll a seven or better for a crew rate check. And I don't. But my numbers are improving. Soon, soon we will synchronize, and the Imperial burning pig dogs will be facing the might of our Misan guns. So, Mike, you should go through and roll your crew rate checks. All right. Crew rate checks. Tholon Mober. Mm -hmm. That's a that's a miss. Yep. Sam Bicca wor worse, and the Hellar. Felconi. Yeah. Note that the Hillar Fel note that the Hillar Felconi is technically the uh, ship that has our protagonist character on, um, because he's still getting his crew in shape. They're not quite as uh, they're, they're not quite as tight as the, on the uh, Sam Bitka and the Thulon Mober. Not that it helped. Not that it helped that much. <laughs> you really want to fight, don't they? Yes. So when aggressive targeting happens, this means that the ship that is aggressive must target uh, any non-interceptor or independent weapons at the ship that is closest if it's going to fire at all. It can choose not to fire, but if it is going to fire, it must fire at whatever ship is closest. What this means is that since this is done in his public information uh, before the start of the uh, before the start of each turn or the plotting phase of each turn, is if you know somebody has a really dangerous ship and you have a sacrificial ship, you want your sacrificial ship to get closer to that really dangerous ship that's aggressive, so that it wastes all of its fire on it. Uh, but this gives a little bit of the chaos of what actually happens in combat, rather than everybody always targets the most dangerous thing. Alrighty, so the next thing we're going to do is move crew between locations. Uh, right now, the only crew location I need to worry about is I have a damage control party sitting here on hit location 6 on this particular ship, and I should go and assign my damage control parties here 
on the Vlajdaddles. Wow, they have much better damage control parties than the uh, Cruiser does. Uh, one is going to go on 6, one is going to go on 10, one is going to go on 2. The reason why this is important is that your damage control parties can only fix things in the hit locations that they are in, and it takes time to move between hit locations. And I'm going to duplicate that down here. And I'm going to duplicate that down here. So I've got these on 10 so that they can repair damage to uh, the thrusters, the movement track. I've got them on 6 so that they can repair damage to the pivot track. And I've got them on 2 so they can repair the biggest weapon on the ship. And remind me where I find out how many of those I have to assign. Ah, right. So right there, on, yes. right there on hit location, you have three boxes. It is possible to put more damage control parties in more hit locations. Uh, this is sometimes a worthwhile strategy, and if you want to make a ship that is basically, you know, like the Borg and automatically regenerates, you just put a lot of damage control parties all throughout so they don't have to travel very far. All right, so I've assigned that, and now we're going to go back over to here. Uh, and we're, we, don't have any, any, we don't have anything else to do on this, so now we're going to go from the pre-plotting phase to the record aggression. And this is something that I don't think Mike has seen. I'm going to switch over to the map here. Uh, so, I'm going to click my aggression. And notice, what happen and notice what happens when I click the aggression. By the way, Mike, you've gotten away from your microphone. Oops. Yep. So, notice what happens. I click it here, and notice what happens to my end of turn marker on the map. And let me know when you've done that on yours, Mike, and I'll force a sync. Go ahead. Obviously, we are... Uh, very much uh, in tune with the need for great dignity in our gaming. <laughs> and now we're in the plotting phase. So I'm going to walk through this a little bit here. Uh, I'm doing movement plotting for the Dabble Jorder Haldo, Haldo, because that's the thing that's on the top up here. It is aggressive, so I get to, you know, I get a reminder that it's aggressive. Aggressive targeting doesn't actually restrict where I maneuver to. It only restricts, it only restricts my fire. Right now we have a play called the AVID, or Attitude Vector Information Display. This blue hexagon is the hex my ship is in. Inside the hexagon we have a top-down view of a sphere. Uh, where I'm wiggling my mouse right now is, nine, is 90 degrees up. Where I'm wiggling it now is 30 degrees up. Where I'm wiggling it now is uh, sorry, 60 degrees up. The blue ring is 30 degrees up. And the yellow ring is level with the map, or 0 degrees up. I can see a mark that says more or less where my opponent's end of turn marker is going to be, and that more that, that's pretty much where I need to point my big terrifying gun. So I'm going to click here and move my nose marker on over. Triangle is the nose, semicircle is the aft, star is the top, anchor is the bottom, uh, left side marker, right side marker, and the symbols that are in the bottom half of the sphere are in these dashed circles. You'll notice that it turned this to uh, sort of a fuchsia, uh, that means that at the end of my turn, we will be at about range 26 from one another, which will be outside of his weapon ranges and just a little bit outside of mine, unless he does me a favor and, you know, thrusts aggressively to get closer to me. So I was explaining the AVID, and I was explaining the orientation markers that are on the AVID. Uh, one of the things that is recorded on here, you can do a little bit of data entry for setting up your ships. Uh, my ship, the Davil Jorder, has a maximum thrust of 6 Gs and it has a maximum pivot rating of four AVID windows per turn. I only did a little bit of an AVID window, a one-window pivot, to point my nose on where I will see uh, the Samuel Bitka at the end of the turn. And I don't see any particular reason to thrust at the moment, because I have longer-ranged weapons than Mike does. And just to show you one of the other cool features we've got here, if I click on the 3D button, he says clicking on the 3D button and hoping it works, Hmm. Okay, there it is, finally. Uh, I get another render of the uh, ship. Uh, it's a little bit more zoomed in, and it basically gets to show me what my orientation looks like. Uh, this is a box miniature on a tilt block, which, if you're familiar with my games, will be fairly straightforward. But this is showing a ship angled up with its nose at a 30-degree angle. Um, we have some tools on here that allow us to put the box miniature art on the virtual box miniatures in the game. And I can even show it in an AVID ball view, where it's put in a, where the box miniature is put in a virtual AVID ball, and you can kind of see where 
the target's end of turn marker is going to be relative to where my relative to where my end of turn marker will be. I'm going to return back to this, and we're going to go on to the other part. So normally, uh, if I'm applying thrust, I will get some control over where I get to uh, wiggle my thrust by clicking these buttons up and down, uh, or left and right for side slipping. But since I since I'm not actually applying thrust at the moment, these are all disabled. So I'm done plotting with the Davel Jorder, and I'm going to quickly go through the plots on the other two. Double check here. Oops. Right, my thrust does not cost any action points. these eventually, so I'll just leave it on that one. And I want to gain a little bit of altitude, and hey, I get to show you that thing I was telling you about before. And here's the other one. One window pivot. Thrust of four. And a little bit of vector going up and a little bit and a little bit to my left. The blue line that's on here uh, on this little hex map shows me where my current vector is taking me, and this is showing me how I'm adjusting my vector a little bit. Uh, so I'm done plotting, Mike, are you? I am done plotting. Okay. And there it is, adjusting our EOTs such as they need to be. And I'm going to advance. Normally this is a step in the manual game, or in the play in, in, in meat space game, where everybody adjusts their end of turn marker based on their thrust and their plot and their movement. Uh, and everybody does this at the same time so nobody gets an advantage by, you know, being slow. And now we're moving our ships. And you'll see on my screen over here, that the Samuel Bitka is at altitude is in hex 2010 plus 12. Uh, it's also in a stack of uh, 12 white tiles. Uh, it's got some end of turn markers that are now behind the ship because I have a feeling that Mike is going to desperately try to get back uh, to the rendezvous point with the information that the, this is where the Jordani are. Uh, you'll see that my uh, ships have all tilted, have all shifted so that they're angled up at a 30 degree angle, and that my two smaller ships now have a vector that's taking a little bit farther in front of the big ship. And now we're in the allocate defenses phase, which is where Mike gets to do something cool. So one of the ways that we show the, tech lo the, the technology advantage that the Imperium has over the Jordani, uh, their tech level 15, the Jordani are 14, is that we gave the Imperials uh, one ECM box, which basically makes them easier, which makes it harder for everybody else to hit them by a little bit. Uh, but it costs one of his uh, precious, precious action points to use. And this is where we record our action point, our ECM and ECCM, and I'm just never going to be doing anything on this on this window. Let me know when your data entry is done, Mike. Data entry done. Thank you. And now we're in the combat phase, and we're going to go over to the firing arcs window. All right. <clears throat> so, I'm going to shift back on over to my bigger ship. Uh, and we're going to cycle through any of Mike's to see if I have anything there that gets out to range 23. Sorry, range 25. I need to actually zoom in on this a little bit so I can read the text. Yeah, my guns go out to range 25. And by my count, no. Close. <laughs> uh, the Samuel Bitka is at range 26, so one hex outside of range. Uh, we don't need that. The Hillar County is at range 27, and the Thulon Mober is at range 27. So the red range is the range from my ship to his ship. The blue range is the range from my ship to his end of turn marker, which gets useful for launching missiles, which is something that Mike is going to be doing very shortly here. 
Well, maybe not. You're not quite close. You're not quite in the missile range. Um, down here at the bottom, uh, where I'm wiggling my mouse, you'll notice that it, cha that it shows the left, side si the left side symbol and a number in uh, parentheses. The left side symbol means that if I could actually shoot the Thulon over here at uh, this range, or the Samuel Bitka at this range, I would be firing at plus two to my accuracy, uh, uh, my, to my accuracy number because of his profile and his ECM, and I would be hitting him on the left side of the ship with a range of 26 and an EOT marker of 26. So we're effectively out of weapons range here for me. Same for you, Mike. Worse. So there will be no uh, shoot nading on this particular turn. So I'm going to go back to the turn tab, and we're going to go to the crew action phase. And I don't think that there's anything that we're going to be doing on the crew action phase, because the only thing we're going to be doing here is going to be damage control. And so far there isn't any. Mm-hmm. We're working on it. We're working on it. <laughs> Getting there. Mm -hmm. So now we're on to turn two of the pre-plotting phase. Any questions on all of that, Dan? Nope. This is all pretty standard squadron strike stuff so far. Alrighty. We generate action points. I don't need to move my crew units around. Uh, we do need to uh, check for aggression for aggressive fire. So yes, we do. There's I'll my damage. Please do. Thulon Mober. Pass. Not a great... Uh, full control. The, the Sam Bitka. Also pass. And... The Hilar Falcani. New. Just failed. And now we're going to go see if I can be aggressive. Yeah. That uh, ship has, has seen prey. As is that one. Oh, I'm glad I'm getting rid of all of these twos. Maybe I shouldn't be so sanguine about yeah. those twos. Come back, twos! I didn't mean to scare you! All right, so, on to recording aggression. Yes, yes, yes. Just the one for a change. Mm-hmm. One of the things you'll note here is that the Imperial ships generally have a better crew rate uh, on this particular part of it. Uh, that was something of a balancing factor we put in, uh, and it also just seemed to fit the setting a little bit better. For the crew factors set by the scenario, uh, do players have a certain amount of decision-making? Is it randomized? So, in the scenarios, uh, the scenarios will always list the crew rate for the ships in that particular scenario. Uh, there is also a little formula that there's also a little formula that players can use if they're just doing a points on points battle and they want to balance out the points by having a slightly better crew rate or get a get a ship a little bit cheaper by having a slightly worse crew rate, which is sort of what we did with the double Jordan Holder um, or Haldlow rather. Um, one of these days I'll learn how to you know pronounce uh, Giordani names and everybody be terrified. Uh, there are a couple of optional rules that say uh, if you want to have slightly randomized crew factors, because the uh, crew rate can basically vary by plus or minus one depending on you know who's having a bad day that who, you know, who's PO'd at which uh, division officer that day. There's a uh, t there's a little table in the squadron strike rulebook where you can basically roll a die and see if your crew is see if your crew rate is uh, temporarily increased or uh, reduced by one. Uh, long term, if you're playing a ship through a long span campaign, there are roles that you can make uh, after surviving particularly after surviving a certain number of battles or being in service that can permanently increase or decrease your crew rate as the base.
So for the Davil Jorder, I picked a thrust that is the maximum I can do without spending an action point on it. In many ways, the Jadavid Litz is a light cruiser designed by people who would never have to serve on one or, you know, write the we're sorry your family has, we're sorry your family member has died letters from somebody who served on one. Alrighty, I am done plotting on both. Uh, I'm done plotting on all of my ships, Mike. Are we ready to move on? Not quite, but almost. Okay, cool. All right, for better or for worse, I'm plotted. All right. And we have done the adjust DOT phase. And we are now moving our ships. One of the very weird things for me, since I play a lot of Squadron Strike in person, is that I'm used to this particular part of the turn being entirely about um, hands reaching into the middle of the map and, you know, being careful not to knock each other's playing pieces over. It's sort of nice to have this all automated. And I should... Hey, Ken, can you move the view? Yeah, I was about to ask if you could do that. Yes. Oops. How's that? Better. Okay. Um, all right. We're in the allocate defenses phase. And I'm going to look ahead a little bit and go, hmm. I'm at range 19. None of my guns go out to range... Uh, none of his guns go out to range 19. Uh, my particle beams on the small ships only go out to range 16. So these guys are out of range. And the, key, and the spinal mounted uh, keel gun is in arc. Yeah, so I know what I'm doing. Activating ECM and praying. Uh, and you'll notice as I cycle through my targets here that the Thulon Mover, which is that ship there, uh, is one window off of my nose uh, for both of it, so I would have had to have pivoted a little bit farther to actually fire at the Thulon Mover. But both the Samuel Bitka and the uh, Hilar Falcani uh, are in line, are, are lined up for the, uh, are, are lined up for the shot. And I did this before allocating my defenses because I wanted to make sure I didn't need to actually activate sand or anything like that because none of his lasers can reach me at this particular point. By coming in with a longer ranged weapon and a slower approach, I have managed to maximize the use of my longer ranged weapon. Mike, have you allocated your defenses? Are we ready to go on to uh, turning on ECM? Yes, we are. Okay. The good news for Mike is that he doesn't have to spend any of his precious, precious sand, because it won't do him any bit of good. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yep. Time to do your data entry. EW plotted. Okay. Now, in ships that have a few more things to spend things on, actually turning on 
the uh, ECM or ECCM can be a little bit more of a it can be a little bit less of a no-brainer decision than it is in the Sloan. Um, and now we're in the combat phase where we're plotting attacks. And I'm, I'm doing, and I bet the can can guess as well. Yep. Okay. There's the Samuel Bitka. There's the Hilar Falcani. All right. So you're not firing. Well, actually, you might be firing. Uh, are launching. you launching? You're I'm launching, launching six missiles. missiles. Yep. Alrighty. All right. Alrighty. Uh, I don't actually have missiles to launch, so I'm going to abort out of this before I do so. But this is how the tool allows you to launch missiles. Uh, you click on the missile button, and it will launch missiles at whatever ship you from the ship you have selected to whatever ship you have targeted. And you can select the number of missiles you're launching. Mike's ships each have two missile launchers, so he would select like this. Um, and I'm just going to cancel out of that so that we don't have to worry about it. It assigns a missile ID number, and when this is taken care of, you just hit, you just click the green button and it launches those missiles. Uh, I'm hitting the red button because I don't have any missiles to launch. And what happens with this behind the scenes is that it is shooting a missile from his ship to my end of turn marker. His ships are here, here, and I should rotate this a little bit so you can see the last one in the back. Ah! Wire pan control. <laughs> Wire pan controls on the left mouse button and not the right. And there's his third one in the back. So. He is, prob he is chucking missiles, in all likelihood, at, these end of turn at the uh, end of turn marker for the biggest ship, because that's his big target. Uh, my little ships are more or less relying on the fact that, uh, oh, hey, I'm so much smaller than that big ship that's terrifying you that maybe I can get close and hurt you. <laughs> but he's launching his missile from here to probably here, or here, or here, more than likely here, and I will find out what it is afterwards. Um, my fire is immediate, and I am going to go and make some attack rolls. Are you ready to receive, Mike? Standing by. Okay. Uh, the Devil Jorder Haldlow is firing on the Samuel Bitka, and I am making a full-on attack roll. Uh, I would normally need a 6 or better to hit. I'm firing through a plus 2 shift, so I need an 8 or better to hit. If I hit with this 8 or better, the second shot automatically hits. If I miss, I get a second shot. That's an accuracy of 5. With a penetration roll of 3, uh, that's going to miss. And I'm going to take the second shot. Because why not? Oh, missed it by 1! <laughs> This is your makeup for the last game. Yes, yes it is. Uh, so penetration is a weird die roll that's part of Squadron Strike. Uh, you roll two ten-sided dice, you subtract a lesser number from the greater number. So this pen roll of three was a die roll of ten minus seven is a... Uh, pen roll of three is a die roll of ten minus a die roll of seven. And this pen roll of zero is a pair of sixes. Uh, all weapons are capped on the maximum amount of penetration that they can get based on the weapon design. For the spinal missons, that penetration cap is nine, which is the highest you can get, which is the highest you can get in the game. Uh, for the turret energy beams, you'll notice that they have a very high penetration value and modest amounts of damage. Although damage four is kind of terrifying at close range. Uh, the bay particle beam has slightly more dam it has some um, fairly decent damage amounts and Fairly high pen, but not peak pen. And the turret lasers are nice, reliable, very low variable damage weapons. Uh, they're also fairly accurate, but damage 2, damage 1, damage 1, penetration 3, penetration 3, penetration 2. There isn't a lot of variability in, in laser damage. All right. So are we ready to advance, Mike? Yep. Okay. I'm going to click the turn button. And oops, and then we're going to advance. And I'm going to click on over to the list value. Oops, 
Actually, I'm going to force a sync so that we can show Mike's missiles. And I have one erroneous uh, flight of missiles. Let me see if I can delete that. The extra from the Thulon Mober? Yep. Okay. Going at the Niebuhr Freeve? <laughs> yeah, I've had the, had the wrong ship uh, selected. Yep. We'll ignore that one. Yep. You should be able to click it and remove it. Uh, yeah, just click Resolve. And that removes it. I've already removed it for you. Oh, thank you. Yep. So, we're going to take a quick look at the list here for the missiles. You'll notice they have a little missile icon in front of them. They have the target, that, they have the ship that launched them. Uh, they have a unique missile ID, which is used internally. Uh, it tells you that it was launched on, two, uh, on turn two at the Davil Jordan Haldlo, uh, and that there are two missiles in the salvo. Uh, same thing over here from the Samuel Bitka, same thing over here from the Thulong Over. And we're in the crew action phase, and there is no damage control to be done. Now we're in the pre-plotting phase for turn two. And, and we're ready to make some aggressive fire checks. Yeah, yeah, we are. I'll lead off again. Go right ahead. The Thulon. Pass. Mm -hmm. Sam Bitka. Also passed. Cool under fire. Mm -hmm. Oh, it, he, he didn't even notice it. He, he didn't even notice it missed him. <laughs> well, that nine seven to nine looks very much like a uh, all according to plan to me. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and now we come with wi fun. Alrighty. So the Devil's Order Haldlo uh, has no Misun gun to fire this turn. But I'm going to make a crew rate check. And hey, welcome back, twos! You don't owe us Zulinski any money, do you? <laughs> you, mean, you mean Mike Zabrowski? No. Zabrowski, yes. <laughs> hey, the Nieberfriv is not aggressive. Not that that's going to help him much. And the uh, Estiazadur. Is not aggressive. So obviously the uh, cruiser captain is pissed off at, at the miss. Something like that. <laughs> There's all kinds of narrative out there, and you know the uh, uh, the two fledged battle captains are going, "Hey, it's up to us." <laughs> <laughs> they're doomed. Probably, but you know they're ablative. Uh, they're, they're ablative frigates. Yes. Alrighty, back to the turn phase. Time to record aggression. Done. Done. And now back to the plotting phase. Let's check to see what that is. Marks. That is in the Bay Particle Beam marks. That's good. Let's not apply. Let's actually apply a little bit of thrust. Oh, long ship. There we go.
So one of the things that I'm doing right now with the uh, Davil Joder Halblow is I'm applying a thrust of is I'm applying my thrust of four, but I'm not pivoting, which means that I will have a little bit more flexibility in where I move because I'm going to be getting displacement over time for constant thrust. I do want to do this. Yeah, I need to swing my vectors around a little bit closer to where I'm going to go. So one of the things you may be noticing is that as I adjust this on the map, you can kind of see where my end of turn marker is shifting. As I do my little side slip uh, choices. Okay, the Davil Jordan is taken care of. You reprieve. You, I need to actually pivot my nose onto and hope that you didn't do anything strange. For what it's worth, I'm going to rename my cat Nieberfreeve. <laughs> the consulate is pleased with this honor. And don't blame me for the name. They actually have rules for for this. <laughs> yep. In the uh, original supplements they put out on each of the alien races, they included wor language structure and word generators. And some kind person implemented, implemented those on their website and we've hit that frequently. Okay, so there's no need to apply thrust to get to that range bracket. But just to make sure he doesn't do anything clever, uh, let's apply thrust anyway. See what that does for our arcs. Yeah, that's good. So there are two schools of thought in how to plot your maneuver with multiple ships in squadron strike. One of them is you try to make sure that all of the ships are doing more or less the same maneuver, um, or even identical maneuvers from the entire time from each turn that you go through. I tend to be a little bit more of the let there be a little bit of chaos. Uh, and don't try to fly tight formations, because the, especially in Traveler, the benefits of the tight formations are somewhat reduced um, because uh, point defense and because concentrating fire when you have uh, burst shielding isn't quite as important. I am done plotting, Mike. Plotted. Okay. And we're adjusting EOT markers, and notice that two of my EOT markers are, my EOT marker listings are listed in bold. That means that they've actually changed this turn. Mm. And now we're going to move all of our ships. All right. Ken, can you zoom in a little? Oh, sure. Thank you. I'm very glad that you were asking questions like that, because I tend to focus more on the uh, uh, on the Avid Assistant part, because that's what I'm used to flying with. I just like to get... If you've got the pretty pictures, you should use them. Yes, yes. So this may not be relevant specifically to this scenario, but more of a general question. What is your best advice, philosophy on both launching missiles and avoiding them on the flip side? 
so in Squadron Strike, uh, there isn't much uh, there isn't much utility in trying to avoid missiles in most universes. There is a weapon trait called Avoidable, which is which we use in Axonar, where we don't actually have interceptor weapons. That makes it possible to avoid missiles, but that's mostly a case of adding penalties to hit for how much you can change the geometry of the shot between when they're launched and when they land. Normally what happens when people are firing missiles is they launch them, and unless they're really, really cooperative, those missiles are going to hit you unless you shoot them. Those missiles are going to get a chance to make an attack roll unless you get to shoot them down. Um, we're going to be seeing me shooting down missiles, well, we hope, <laughs> uh, on this turn. <laughs> Assuming your crew has woken up. <laughs> so we've done the movement phase. Uh, allocate defenses. So this is where I have to go and make some decisions. Uh, I'm going to start with the Davil's order. Okay, so if the Sambitka fires on me at range 12, which he might very well because he's at a range where his weapons are in arc and in range, uh, he's firing on my forward shield facing. I know this because, well, it's in this uh, dark, uh, this, this box that's bounded here for the nine windows that are, for the nose, the window that my nose is pointed through and the eight adjacent to it. This facing over here is the left side, this is the right side. The aft is split between uh, two parts, just to kind of keep the nose kind of centered. Uh, this is the bottom facing, and this is the top facing. Uh, let us go see where we're going to see the missiles coming in. So the missiles are coming in straight at my nose, which is good, uh, because it means that I have uh, four turret lasers that I can shoot at them. This is bad. This is bad for this particular one because, well, I don't get the three rear-facing ones because they don't quite line up. Uh, the Hilar Falconi is one hex outside of beam range. Yay! Uh, the Hilar Falconi's mo uh, missiles are coming in at uh, at a range of thirteen, which is you know, pretty much their maximum range, um, and they're also coming in straight at my nose, so that simplifies things. And that one is coming in straight to my nose, simplifying things. So it looks like all of the dam it looks like all of the ships that can actually shoot me are firing on the nose. Uh, and only one ship with lasers can actually uh, can actually do follow-up damage on the missile strike. Uh, which would be the Samuel Bitka, which is at range 12. And I'm going to power up. I'm going to use ammunition for two belts of sand, just in case I miss one of, just in case one of those missiles manages to survive. So I'm marking off the units of sand ammunition, uh, and Mike gets to go and make some decisions on uh, what he's going to be doing with his ships, because, yeah, I've got a range 9 shot on the SAM, and a range 10 on the Hilar, and I've got, a range, I've got two range 9 shots on the SAM. So Mike gets to decide how much sand he's putting in in case I actually hit with those uh, Bay Particle Beams and with my turret lasers. So one of the cute things that I can do is I can go take a look and see if the Thulon Mober can actually do any decent fire on any of those missiles that are coming in on the Doppeljorder. And the short answer is no. Uh, when I'm looking from this ship to the missiles, the blue number is the closest approach that, that missile makes to that particular ship for doing escort fires, which is one of those things that is absolutely lovely 
Um, ooh, hey, I might be able to have the neighbor free do something useful. Five, four, five. Yep. My escorts have gotten a little bit too far ahead of me. This is the downside of the uh, chaotic movement pack, uh, the chaotic movement package. That means they can't use any of their lasers to fire at um, these missiles that are coming in at me. Alrighty, I'm ready to go to uh, allocate ECM. Hello, giant fuzzy beast of doom. You are being you are being very noisy. And I just remembered uh, a good place to put my other action point. Mm -hmm. So one of the th one of the side effects of being able to use uh, of using the burst mode shielding is that we allow you to use action points to reinf uh, to uh, reinforce your sand uh, by spending action points on them, which in universe is my crews are highly focused on making sure that there is more sand in the way of those laser beams. You're done uh, recording your your electronic warfare. Yes. Okay. Oh, wait, wait. Ah, too late. You oh. said yes, and I clicked the button. I was, I was still, I was still in the. Am I still planning this? Yes. Mm. I, I asked. Well. Okay. Yep. Hopefully, you got the one on the Sam Bitka. <laughs> Probably not. We'll assume that you did. <laughs> Excellent. So we're now in the combat phase. The first phase of the combat phase is going to be uh, defensive fire. And I am going to go and use some of these filters. I'm going to go use heat maps and missiles and torpedoes uh, that are on the map. And once again, this confirms that the Dabble Jorder is seeing these two missiles coming in through the nose. And it's seeing these missiles coming in through the nose. And then I'm going to double check with my other two ships. And yeah, I'm not going to get a uh, shot within the appropriate range. Oops, the other way. Let's check the other missiles real quick. Nope. Nope. All right. So, going over to firing arcs here, uh, I have four turret lasers, uh, the two in Mount T and the two in Mount uh, U. Each of those turret lasers has the intercept trait, which allows them to fire on incoming missiles at a range of three. Each of them generates five interception points. So between those four missile, be between those four turret lasers, I have uh, 20 interception points to allocate among uh, six inbound targets. And I am going to be putting uh, three on each of them, and two of them are going to be getting four. And it's probably time to switch on over the dice so that Mike can actually see if, his, see if any of his missiles survive. For those watching at home, what Mike is going to be doing is pushing the 2d10 minus button, and on the two that have four interception points on them, he needs to roll a five or higher. On the ones that have three, he needs to roll a four or higher. Take it away, Mike. All right, let's go with the Thulon Mobers with as the fours, looking for fives sure. or a five or higher. Yep. And one, two, dead. Two, dead. Next two. Three, dead. That, uh, the Hilarfeld County has one that makes it through. That's a hit. Well, that's a connect, that, that's a reaches the target. Yes. Mm -hmm. And the Sambic has two missiles. Dead. And alive. Dead and alive. So we have two missiles that made it. Uh, I have a nuclear damper on my ship uh, that is going to need a six or better to hit, uh, or a, a six or better to nullify it. 
So I'm going to make a d10 roll. First nuclear damper. On a 6+, plus, one of those surviving missiles is dead. Nope, it's alive. And the second one. I should actually select the right ship for this, shouldn't I? Uh, second one. Yep. Uh, so one of your missiles actually makes it through all of my defenses, and we'll get to make an attack roll. That will be in the standard fire step, which is what we're coming on here. Oh, you just rolled for the you just rolled for the missile. So uh, let me go and pop up your SSDs so that people can take a look at your missile table. So the small missiles have an accuracy of one plus, so that two actually hits. Uh, they have a base damage of three, and they have a penetration. They have a maximum penetration of nine. So he just did seven points of damage uh, with that missile. And that seven points of damage will be seven points that I mark off off of my sand. Uh, and I put uh, four of my action points into shield, re into shield regeneration, into shield reinforcement. So that gets uh, almost all of my shield reinforcement off, all of my reinforced sand. So it did its job. Uh, and I'm going to let you do your direct fire first. Okay, the Bicca has a uh, range 12 shot mm -hmm. with, with lasers, and it has, how, let's see... Uh, how, many lasers does, how many lasers does it have in arc? Six. Alrighty. Uh, what window do you see me through, since I don't actually get to see your perspective real well? I have you uh, one up and to uh, the starboard side from uh, the, the nose bearing. All right, yeah, that's that's in all six arcs. Fire away. Six attack rolls. Mm -hmm. Bicca to the Sedivilets. Yep. That's a hit. Uh, that is going to be uh, three damage, of which two is going to make it to the sand. Good, and let's see. Adjusted accuracy is five, by the way. Okay, hold on a second. Uh, let me adjust this. Okay. I need to hold down the shift key so I can see where I'm going. So I've taken the two damage to sand. Next one. That is going to be your maximum damage, which is, what, three at this range? At the long range, it is, yeah, three, three damage, nine pen. Uh, no, you're looking at the missile. Sorry. You're right, one damage, two pen. So, uh, three yeah. damage total. Yep. Marking off three more uh, sand bubbles. Shot three of uh, six. Maybe you'll miss one of these. Not with rolls like that, you won't. <laughs> no, that's another three. Okay, next shot. That's a hit. Another three. Okay, uh, one more bubble. Okay, next shot. That's a hit. Two damage which is going to remove the sand, and the last point of damage bounces off of my armor. Yay, armor. So there is no sand in the way. Just the one point of armor. Just the one point of armor, and you have two more shots left. Let's see if you can actually miss with one of these. I actually make it as one more shot. Uh, yeah, I see five lasers, so one more shot. That's going to be three points. Minus one armor becomes two points, uh, which is exactly what your raking fire threshold is. So that is going to be to location one. Two points to location one is going to be... Let's go shift to the right kind of stamp. That is going to be a cargo box. And that would be a half-filled box of nose hand caster ammunition, but I still have whole boxes left. And once per strike, which is a damage amount plus a hit location, I can substitute one of those points onto a hull box, which I shall do. 
So I am lightly chewed up. And that is all you have in that is all you have in arc and in range, correct? I also have a sh laser shots from uh, the Hillar Fel Felcati. Uh, uh, okay, uh, which fledged out, left or right? <laughs> it's the Abster. Okay, so, that. Okay, that will be that will be the right one. Yep, and again, all all six targets bear. Okay, and. Guess what I forgot? Guess what I didn't do? Reinforce shields. Put turn on sand at all. Turn on sand at all. Oh my. Yep. That was a brain fart on my part. That's, he had a hostile in range. Go ahead and check off a box a box of sand. Okay. I will do it on both of them. So I didn't know because I didn't actually check them. Like okay, I am ready to receive. That's marking me as plus two for profile, which looks a little high. Uh, that should only be a plus one for profile. I'm not sure why that's showing a two. Um. So once again, accuracy five, damage one, penetration two. Uh, this should be a better accuracy than you had on the last one. You should have had a zero shift on the last one, not, a, not that it made any difference. Not with those rolls. Well, I see you've got one for uh, signature. Yep. I think what happened is that it's, I think that what happened is that between when we entered this and when I generated the new ships, uh, something got funky and it didn't actually change the profile numbers because looking at the older SSDs, I should have had a plus one profile from the front and aft on the big ship and I should have a plus two profile from the front and aft on the small ones. So treat it with what we've got in the app, not what's showing on the SSDs, and I will look at what's going on in the SSDs later. All right, so that's a pl plus two profile then? Yep. All right, that's, a, that's adjusted six to hit. All righty, yeah, you need a six plus. Hit for three damage. There goes some sand. Yep. Uh, there goes some shield reinforcement. There goes some shield reinforcement. Next one. Missed. Okay. Next one. Number three. Also a miss. Okay. Next one. Four. Miss. Next one. That's a hit. Five is a hit. No penetration. That will finish killing off my shield reinforcement. And last one and is mm -hmm. clean miss. A myth is a clean miss. You know what? I probably could have saved the sand. <laughs> no, but there was a good chance that was going that was go going to result in enough more. Hits. Oh, I'm, yeah, I am absolutely certain that if I had uh, not used the sand, that something horrifying would have happened. Is that all of your fire? Or do you have any? Or do you have any more? Now the Thulon is just out of range to everybody. Okay, go launch your missiles, and then I will send my fire back at you. I do. I do believe I've already plotted the missiles. Excellent. Cool. Alrighty. So. The Devil Jorder is. I'm going to go ahead and do this and just do uh, normal targeting, ships and squadrons. Ships and squadrons. So, the Devil Jorder is going to be spending its uh, one act. Is, is spending the one action point that wasn't used on shield reinforcement. Uh, to fire its bay particle beam at the Sambitka. And the Sambitka is out of range of the energy beams, much to my sadness. I'm okay with it. <laughs> so, the Sambitka uh, has a profile of one, according to this. Uh, two, because of your ECM that we forgot, that we uh, messed up on. Uh, 
So, the May Particle Beam needs a 9 plus to hit you. That's not a 9 plus. No, no, it isn't. <laughs> the Nibrafreeve uh, is at range 9 from the Sambitka. And the Sambitka has a plus 2 on the profile number, but range 9 is a, better, is a much better range bracket. It needs a 7 plus to hit you. That's a hit. Crappy pen, but that's a hit. That'll be uh, 2 pen plus 3 base damage. It's 5 damage. On the Sam. That is the shield reinforcement and four sand boxes. And four sand bubbles. And four sand bubbles. Okay. Uh, the next ship in my queue is going to be the SD the uh, SD Avster. Let's see if I can get a seven plus again. Probably not. That is going to be nine points. That's right, seven points. My bad. Three base damage, four pen. That still isn't enough to. Yeah. Yeah, that leaves me with one lonely sandbox up on, on the forward facing of the uh, sand bitka. Yep. And I should have actually done the uh, Niebuhr Freeves lasers. Uh, they're at range 9, so my lasers need a 6 plus to hit for 1 damage and 3 pen. Uh, please, uh, if you haven't marked that last... Yeah. If you haven't marked that last hit, please unmark it, because I might actually blast down your, uh, your shields before I get to it. Uh, laser number 1 from the Estiazer. I'm oh, sorry, from the Nibrafreeve. That's a hit. Uh, and that is going to be range 9, 2 points of damage. Laser number 2 is going to miss. That's, that's 1 point internal, marks to the 10, marks off a hull box. Uh, I said count this towards the, the damage that I hit before with the uh, particle beam, because I definitely want the particle beam to hit after the lasers. Oh. Yep. So, uh... Third hit. One point. So those lasers did three points of damage uh, between the two of them. And I hit you for seven points, which, which, if I'm doing my head math correctly, means that I got like two points in past your armor I with make, the particle beam. I make it as two points uh, internal, or two points through the sand, one point to. to one point come on, one point is for two points through the sand and armor, correct? I, I've got uh, two, two sand and an, and an armor in the way, so yep, two inside. So two sand and an armor in the way when the seven-point particle beam hits is going to be four inside. Uh, and that four inside is going to be in hit location four and is bursting. So that's just four all around. No, that's not, that's not splash, that's bursting. Uh, it, bursting means that you mark off two boxes in each group before moving on. Oh. So looking at your SSD here... Uh, on hit location four, that eats two hull boxes and then your two damage control boxes. Uh, you can substitute those damage control box. You can substitute one of those damage control boxes for another hull box. Yep. Doing that in. So I still got a damage control party left. Mm -hmm. All right, damage taken. All right. And the lasers from the SDIzer. Uh, no, sorry, the lasers from the Nieper Freeve. Uh, no, the Estiazer. Let's make sure I got this right. Laser number one. Needs a six plus. Hits. Uh, that is going to be three points to location eight, which will be an out of two points after your armor to location eight. Let me know when you're ready. And there's another hull substitution. Go. Laser 2 misses. Laser 3 definitely misses. <laughs> okay, that could have been worse. Yes, yes it could have. Uh, 
Uh, that is all of my fire, and you've already checked your missiles, just to confirm. I'm going to go to turn. I'm going to sink. I'm going to go to list. And yeah, we have plenty of missiles out there. Cool. Yep. That is the end of the combat phase. Correction phase. Damage control. I don't have any damage in a location that already has a d damage control party, so that's a wash for me. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, and I don't have any damage control parties any par in a place with a damage control party, so that's a wash for me. So none this turn. Yep. And on to turn four. So, this is where you get to make some decisions. Uh, I really don't have many to make. Uh, you get to decide if you want to move one of your damage control parties around. Uh, your damage control parties can move by up to... Uh, they can basically move by up to two hit locations per plotting phase. Just enough. So, no, I'm not leaving the hull box with... Uh, I'm not leaving hit location 6 with my pivot track in it on the big ship. And on the little ship... That's just sand that's been expended. Uh, and I'm going to go and erase uh, my sand that was used. There'll be bubbles of marked sand on there. And for those of you watching at home, uh, at some point, we plan on having the software that generates the SSDs integrated with the software that handles the virtual tabletop, so this can actually do your damage for you. But we're not there yet, so we're doing this with uh, stamps in Adobe Acrobat, which can be a little te which can be a little bit fiddly. To put it mildly, yes. Mm -hmm. Double checking. All of my sand is there, and the sand that's actually been expended has been marked off. Cool. Uh, I am that, that is. I'm done with the pre-plotting phase. Uh, we should actually roll some aggressive tar some aggressive targeting. Yes, we should. Because it might actually matter. Crew rate. Hey, the Estiazer isn't aggressive. Uh, the Nibrafreve. You're going to be aggressive. Oh, you're not aggressive. The Devil's Order. Amazing. Yes. None of my ships are aggressive. What about yours? Let's see what we have. On is. Mm -hmm. Sam Bitka is not. Mm -hmm. The Hylar is. Mm-hmm. All right. So record your aggression and let me know when you've got it. Actually, I should be able to see it on the map. You recorded all three. You recorded your uh, ships as aggressive that need it. Yep. Because I'm not seeing it on the. There we go. Okay. And now we're in the plotting phase. And I'm clicking on the nose on this one here so that I can start pivoting through the bottom half of the sphere.
something clever with that. Ooh. Yeah, this will be fun. Yeah, this could could get entertaining. Mm-hmm. Oh, pivot six, how I love you. <laughs> If only you had a ship with Pivot 6. Uh, I do. I'm seeing fives for the Evles Adults. Okay. Interesting. We definitely have some data entry errors in here. Okay. Oh. Yeah, just... But fortunately, I can still get where I need to go with a Pivot of 4. Yeah, I don't think anything but the uh, Aslan Destroyer has a, piv a pivot all the way up to six. That'll be entertaining. Let's do a quick cycle through. Yeah, we're good there. Yeah, we're good there. I am done with the plotting phase. Let me know when you are ready. I am plotted.
So one of the quirks of mode 2 movement, which is vector movement, which is squadron strike's term for vector movement, is that when you are pivoting and thrusting at the same time, you're probably not changing where your end of turn marker is going, because the angle of thrust that you're going through uh, more or less cancels out, and you don't get displacement over time from pivoting while swinging your nose around. This is one of the things that makes the uh, spinal mounts in Traveler a lot more dangerous than you might actually think from the little teeny tiny fire arcs. Uh, you're adjusting EOTs because nothing is adjusting. And move ships. And this probably... Uh, this probably deserves to be linked through a little bit. And so that Dan gets to see all the pretty artwork. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to rotate this around the... Okay, let me center the map over here. And as you can see, we now have a nice separating vector. <laughs> as the Imperials are zooming off that away, and I'm sliding sideways this way, trying to cancel out the vectors I already built up. <laughs> Hours spent playing asteroids as, as a child counts as experience for flying modern <laughs> strike ships. And even with that, Ken and I are both building up a, a, a healthy disengagement vector. Mm -hmm. So, let's see if I can uh, make some of your disengagement moot. So, allocate defenses. Okay. Oh, that's going to be fun. <laughs> That's going to be fun. This is one of those times where I kind of wish I was driving an, Asl an Aslan ship. Not that that particle beam isn't really fun at range. Oh, yeah. So, let's go... Let's go take a look at missiles. Heat maps. Missiles and torps. They're on the map. Oh, good. That gives me some better odds. Great ones. Okay. Range three. Yay. Range four. Let's see if I can get range three from you guys. I can get range four from those. Range three from those. Question is that's not going to be an arc, those will be. 
one, two. So, in theory, two extra lasers. I think I do. So three from there, two from there is five. Come back to here. So the Hilar's lasers. Free, uh, and you are free. So, so bit Kaiser within range three for an intercept shot, and the Thulon Rovers are at range four. Okay. I'm ready to deal with... Oh, sorry. I'm ready to activate defenses. Yep. Okay, I'm standing uh, let me go double check. mark my ECM? Yes. In the next step. Uh, yes. I, I is ready. Mm-hmm. Second, scan regular targeting ships and squadrons. So, ships and squadrons. So, the Hilar can theoretically shoot at those. Nose. No. Uh, nose, nose, left wing on the sand bitka. Let's take a look at the Dabble's order. Nose on the sand bitka. Thulon Lobers on the nose. And the Hilar Fogconi is on the nose. And the missiles are coming in on from the left side, uh, are coming in on the... Let's double check. Let's just be on the safe side. Right side. Yeah, those are getting high. Those are getting high priority targets. Right side. Okay, uh, I'm ready to allocate sand. And actually, while I'm allocating sand, I'm just going to advance, so that while I'm doing that, you can go do your data entry. EW plotted. Yep. Thank you. I'm going and uh, burning my sand ammunition real quick before I forget. I've got mine marked. real quick. Targeting ships and squadrons. Okay, 
So these guys only need to turn on their forward sand. Sand is burned there, and just in case, there's the right sandcaster ammunition. All right, sand is turned on, and I'm ready for defensive fire. All right. Product warfare is taken care of. Okay. And combat phase. Plot attacks. I've got some. I've got a few missiles left in range. Mm -hmm. uh, and I've got some defensive fire to, on the six missiles that are coming in. Um. I have five lasers bearing on six uh, five lasers bearing on six missiles, uh, and I'm going to be throwing in two lasers each from. I'm going to be throwing in uh, two lasers from the uh, Estiazer onto the missiles from the Sambitka as a second group. Lovely. Uh, I don't have I don't have Aegis, so I have to allocate all of these ahead of time. So the two lasers from the Sambitka, from the, the two lasers from the uh, Estiazer, are doing five points each on the two missiles from the Sambitka, and the five lasers that I have from the uh, from the Devil Jorder are doing six points apiece on the other four missiles, uh, with one of them getting seven, which is a little bit of a waste. Actually, this actually the one that's getting seven is going on one of the missiles from the Sambitka. So, shall we go and roll some dice? Absolutely. I'm... So Sam, so Sambitka, we'll do first. Missile number one is getting a shot of one, and then a shot of uh, is getting a shot of one, and then a shot of five. So roll two d ten minus twice for the one, and then the five. One lives. Five dies. Uh, on all of the other four missiles, you're uh, getting uh, six points each. A one. Dies and hits. Lives. And lives. And the Hellar's up two missiles. Dies. And dies. So one of the rules that's in Squadron Strike is that there is never any point in allocating more than six points past the armor value of a missile, because the missile will automatically live on a seven, eight, or nine, which is roughly one in eight. Okay, so I'm going to go and roll a uh, nuclear damper yes. against that one missile that lived. That missile gets eaten by the nuclear damper. Yes, it does. Mm -hmm. Um. Alrighty, so I have fire on. Uh, I have direct fire, and uh, I would like to go first, if that's all right with sure. you. Okay, so first things first is going to be the uh, is the Estiazer is firing its one last laser, and its particle beam at the Hillar. At range eight. Laser at range eight is going to need a six plus to hit you. So attack roll. Laser comes first. Misses just barely. And the particle beam at a range of eight is going to need a seven or better to hit you. That hits. And that is going to be a grand total of 10 points uh, to the sand on the left side of the Hillar Fell County. Leaving me with two. Okay. 
So you didn't have any reinforcement up? No. Well, uh, yes, but not on that arc. Ah, okay. Um, and now the Nibifreve is firing three lasers at range six, uh, which, because I am TL-14, is not a better range bracket. <laughs> Miss? Uh, left side. All at the hill, also at the Hillar left side. First one misses. The second one hits for two points. To location five, if it matters. Okay. Third laser. That is a hit. Uh, and that is going to be three points to location one, which I believe will be a net of uh, two points to location one. Armor stops one. Two points remaining. That is a cargo. And, oh, we're going to hull substitute. Because <laughs> I still got ammo in that first Sandcaster box. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, and now uh, the... And now we're firing the Bay Particle Beam at a range of six, which means it needs a five plus to hit. And I get one pen. <laughs> uh, so, you're going to take four points of damage, bursting to location seven. Four points, location seven, one, one point of armor. Three left. That's a hull. I will hull substitute and still lose a laser. Okay. Did anything get to SI? No. Okay. So, because I rolled really poorly on that penetration roll, um, if I had done another four points of damage on that shot, what would have happened? Would it reach your SI or not? Four points. Let's see. Yeah, the only. Sand, that would have been a, a sandcaster hit, and then where's bursting the one? Bursting is the one that does uh, pairs of hit. Pairs of damage. Pairs of damage to each group. Enough damage to mark off two boxes in each group. Two. Yeah, that would have hit. That would have wiped out my left sandcaster ammo, and then uh, two would have wrapped. Okay. And that was the Nibirfreeve. And the Devil's Order. The Devil's Order, fortunately for the Hill Arfel County, is at range 8. Yes. And firing, Unfor and firing on a different batch of sand. Who cares about sand? That's the this is a Misun gun. <laughs> oh, crap. Here it comes. <laughs> so, the Misun gun at this range hits on a 2+. Uh, and I am uh, ignoring the sand, ignoring the armor, but not ignoring your ECM or profile number, so I need a 4 plus because of your profile. First hit, or first attack. Yeah, that'll be both of them. That will at least get both of them hitting. <laughs> I like the zero penetration, though. I'm not fond of it, but... <laughs> uh, so, that is going to be a... Six point hit to the nine, and it ignores component armor. Don't have any. Not bursting? <laughs> Not bursting. A one, a two, three, four. I got the wrap symbol, so that goes down to six, correct? Or goes down to ten? Goes down to ten. A hull box and hit the drives. Okay. You get to do a hull substitution on that before the next one hits. Thing. Mm, Substituted. Mm -hmm. And the second one, we're just going to ignore the accuracy check. That's a little bit more like it. Uh, that is going to be a 13 point hit to the two. Sorry, a twelve. Point, sorry, that is a, an eleven point hit to the two. I'm going to make my last uh, hull substitution as two, 
three pops of laser, and uh, the rest of it's going to SI. Okay, so this has no blow through, and two times hits SI. So, uh, how many how much damage is left out? Uh, that's eight damage left, correct? Okay, out of that eight damage left, uh, the first five points mark off ten SI, which I think kills your ship. <laughs> Bang. Mm -hmm. That's the that's the Halar blown clean out of space. Yep. Well, this is the, the, the this is the second time we've blown this one up, and this is the one that's supposed to live. <laughs> I don't pick the targets. No, you don't. No, you don't. But it was range eight and range six. How could I not? <laughs> I would have. Mm hmm. All right, so let's have your return fire. Well, he's a good officer, and he leads from the front. As I recall, I had no uh, damage weapons at the beginning of the turn. You did not. So let's see. Arcs. Well, the, the Halar is returning, returning fire. Let's see. Mm -hmm. Two diagonal up. Double check arcs for everybody. I'm going to pick on something I might actually be able to uh, badly hurt. Uh, the neighbor from okay. is, 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 take, is taking uh, six lasers from the. From okay. The okay, that is the uh, left hand one on my uh, ship sheet. Yep. Alrighty. And according to this, I have a that is range six with a plus two to probe. That is correct. So uh, fives or better hit. Okay. Six of them. Okay. And what is your damage uh, at this range? Is it one three or one two still? It's one three. Okay, so you can actually get decent damage. Cool. Yep. First one. Shot one of six. Missed. Number two. Mm -hmm. That's a hit for four points of damage. That blows off all of my shield reinforcement. All of my reinforced sand, rather. Three. That's a miss. Miss. Four is a hit for three points. Yes, it is. Uh, I will mark off three sand. One. Put that in the shift key, please. Three sand marked. Number five. Miss. Miss. And six. Also missed. Okay. So, your next ship. Sam Bicca. Same target. Same. Similar. Same numbers. Nope. That's a range seven shot, so. Back, maximum damage is three. And, I, and you need a six plus to hit. And I need a six to hit. Yep. Number one. Miss. Two, hit for three. Okay, three. Hit for three. Hits for three. Number four. Miss. Number five. Miss and six. That's a hit for three more. Hit. Sand is down, so. From Hell's Heart, the Hilar Falcone can stab at me. Yeah. Here, here, here comes the Athulon, which is mm -hmm. six more. Alrighty. First one. Missed. Second one. Hit for one. Bounces off the armor. <laughs> for three is a miss. Miss. Four is a miss. Five is a hit for two. One point internal to location ten. To location ten. I will take that in a hull box. Let me go and get the right stamp. Hey, I will get to permanently destroy a hull box because I will have crew rate check. <laughs> and one and one last. Mm-hmm. 
hit for two nets to the to the two. One to cargo. One to S1, which I do not wish to lose, so I will take that on the other hull box and hit location 10. Okay, that is all your fire, correct? That is all my fire. All right. We'll actually get to show damage control attempts. At least I will. Yep. All right, activating cloaking device. You wish you had one? Yes. Uh, boarding party combat, we don't have damage control. I've got one. So, yep. So, what are you repairing? I'm, re I'm repairing the uh, two box on my damage control, for my damage control parties. Okay. That is, that is a crew rate check, if I remember correctly. That is indeed, and you're probably using the crew that is that, that is a crew rate check, and until you've lost all of your damage control parties, uh, your crew rate check is unchanged. All right, that's the Sam Bitka's roll. Mm -hmm. Got it. That that succeeds. That does. Okay, so uh, this is the Nibirfreev making its attempt to repair a hull box in uh, hit location 10. Crew rate? I succeed. Wow, that, that's unusual for me. Usually what happens when I'm attempting damage control parties is that apparently my crew really likes to go through and make extra... Um, you know, extra spacious holes on the ship to make it go faster or something. Yeah. Atmosphere just slows you down, right? Yeah, something about drag. <laughs> All right, that is turn four crew action phase. Uh, you should go to the list and select the Hilar Falcani and uh, get and uh, remove it. Bye bye. Mm -hmm. Pre-plotting phase. Go look at the map. I'm generating action points. I'm not sending any of my crew units to go jog uh, for the damage control parties. <clears throat> so aggressive fire checks for me. Nibafreev, crew rate check. Not aggressive. Estiazer, crew rate check. Not aggressive. Double Jorder, crew rate check. Not aggressive. <laughs> nice. Okay, mm -hmm. mine. Sambitka, aggressive. Mm -hmm. And the Thulon, not aggressive. Alrighty. All righty. Uh, I believe we're on to recording aggression. Yes. Marked. Mm -hmm. Hitting the refresh button just so I can see it. And the plotting phase. As we drift farther and farther and farther away. <laughs>
this way. This one, on the other hand, we have to do this way. We. So the Avid part is done. You still have extensive vectors going down. Let's double check and see what your actual vectors are. This is one of the cute tricks. Yep. Okay. Oh yeah, we're totally separating. <laughs> and I aims to increase that. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, you've got two turns, you've got, you know, not this turn, but turn six before the, the horrifying Nissan gun uh, can come up again. And I hope to, put, to be pushing extreme range when it does. Mm Anyway, and for those watching uh, at home, uh, what I'm looking at is down here it shows my vector and it has a delta, and I'm trying to build up more of my vectors in D to reduce his rate of separation a little bit. Because right now my current vectors are 9F, 3A, 4, and plus. <laughs> uh, I am done plotting. I am done plotting. Mm -hmm. And you can see that uh, EOT markers have been adjusted. And you'll notice that uh, the SD Azure, uh is actually go has an ender turn marker that's off the map. I'll show we I'll show you how we fix that in a little bit. Yeah, lots of my stuff is going off the map. <laughs> And mine's working on it. Mm -hmm. So to shift things that are on the map, we go to List, and there's a button that says Shift All Units. It is cleverly hidden on the list of all the units on there, because that's why, because that way nobody can ever seem to find it. Um, and let's take a closer look and see where things are. So we want to go opposite of F, uh, opposite of F is going to be direction C and D. So I'm going to shift everything about 20 hexes in C and 10 hexes in D. 20 C, 10 D, and hit the button, and it does a coordinate transformation. We're going to go to the turn, and I'm going to hit a recycle button. Yeah, there we go. And now everybody is still, now everybody's end of turn marker is still back on the map. Ken, can you go ahead and center everything? Image. Uh, oh, 
Thank you. Oh, you're going to be going off the map too soon. Yeah. <laughs> My defenses are pretty simple with you, you as far as away as you are. You see them, don't bother turning on the sand because they'll take it out of our pay. <laughs> In uh, this tactical configuration, yes, the Admiral would. <laughs> And, uh, yes, the Dabble Jorder doesn't have anything in arc or in range, so I am not going to be uh, shooting anything at you. You're not going to be shooting anything at me. Uh, I'm going to be dealing with the in-ground missiles, heat maps, missiles and torps uh, that are on the map. Ah, oh, it's going after the Neva Freed. Yes, it is. I'm not going to get a shot on that. Uh, the Neva Freed is going to get a shot on that. And the Estiazer is going to get a shot on that. Okay. All right, so there are four missiles coming in. Uh, actually, let's just skip ahead to the defensive fire step. Um, go allocate your ECM, sir. Your cursed, cursed, cursed Imperial ECM. Done. Okay. Uh, defensive fire on the uh, from the Nibir Freeve. Okay. Yeah, this filter still isn't quite doing what I want, so I won't talk to Mike about that. Still have to kind of do some head. They're close enough together that they should be fine. I am using six. I'm using six lasers to uh, do stupid amounts of damage to each of those missiles. Uh, you might as well roll your four missiles. They will need sevens or better to survive on the two to ten minus check. Working. Mm -hmm. Two to ten minus. Nope. And nope. Nope. And the other pair. Nope. And almost. Yep. Okay. And at this point, I think you're going to disengage. <laughs> yes. Uh, because while my light cruiser can match you in thrust, its separation vectors are high enough that by the time it cancels those out, <laughs> I was. you will be you'll be out of weapons range, and uh, you'll be able to point your nose up to get the 4,000 hexes you need to be able to disengage from this gas giant. Yes. <laughs> Which means you did better than the historical outcome, even if the wrong ship died. <laughs> well, send the crews to breakfast, ma maintain full thrust. Yep. Alrighty. That's, uh, exact that's exactly what that b sun gun is designed to do. Mm -hmm. So Dan, now that you've watched this, any comments, feedback? Sorry, I had to find my microphone button. Um, <laughs> as someone who has played the game uh, a few times, I'm mm -hmm. certainly no expert, um, the Traveler setting doesn't really seem to muck things up too much. Um, mm -hmm. It's all familiar mechanics, familiar you know, tactical thinking. Um, mm -hmm. No, I, I feel bad that I didn't have more to offer or more to ask, but... 
once you <laughs> understand the basics of what's happening. Um, How does the sand strike Mike? you as a defensive mechanic? Well, this is a personal question just from the perspective of Squadron Strike in general. I think there's, I, I know what's being modeled, um, mm -hmm. but for, a, for me as a game player, um, sometimes the layered defenses, and this may not speak to the question that you're asking, but it's a, 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 an observation that I had going through it, is that the layered defenses seem to combine in a way that often, I, I would rather see more things going boom, I guess, um, mm -hmm. just as a player on so, in some situations. Um, for, I, I, the way that the, to answer your specific question, the, the, the way that the SAM seems to be modeled and the way that it interacts with the game seems to work fine. I like the idea of using up ammunition to get your shield bubbles. I think that does, to some extent, alleviate that concern because although you will have that initially and you can throw it up, um, because of the limited nature of it, and you're not just able to regenerate it um, con consistently, uh, you have to think a little more about when you're going to use it. It's only applicable in certain specific circumstances, so I think that helps to some degree. I don't, I don't have a specific ultimate comment. Those are just stream of consciousness thoughts that come out. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, Sh shields with uh, ammo restrictions is a it's a nutritional dynamic. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and it's something that I've never seen. In any that's, that's also a point in its favor that it's it's mm -hmm. it, it adds a ta tactical thinking or a thought process that is not having played travel the, any of the other incarnations of the traveler um tactical games i've, I've played the role-playing game um but not having played any of the other tactical games i know that you early on that it's molded any number of different ways um, so i can't say mm -hmm. for sure that it hadn't been used previously but in terms of games i've seen uh, it's it's fairly unique you've got that combination of recharge but also limited ammunition so to speak yeah and it really mm -hmm. encourages uh, tactical play to try and get multiple uh, incoming fire on a ship from uh, multiple bearings to spread out the sand usage because even if you don't fire the ammunition even if you're not fired on the ammunition is still used um yes, that's correct. the yeah and I think the canonical you is a good way go. to do it. Adds a layer of bluff to, a, to, to your st stock uh, squadron strike. The canonical way of using sand, uh, and I say canonical because it was the one that was published first and the one that nearly everybody goes back to for ship-on-ship -ship combat as opposed to fleet-on-fleet -fleet combat, is that nominally you're supposed to put a marker out for sand and, in squadron, and it would dissipate over time. Uh, and the way I would model it in squadron strike is that you throw a sand marker out there and on the first turn that the sand marker is out there, it's uh, two points of ECM for anything that fires through that particular hex and altitude. Mm -hmm. And on the second and third turn that it's out there, it's only one point of ECM for anything that bears through that hex and altitude. Sure. And that would be unplayable in the tabletop game. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, because the thing, that, the, the thing that, that, that causes Squadron Strike to slow down the most, and the reason why I'm constantly talking to Mike about tweaking the filters that you saw me going through on the firing arc diagram, is shooting bearings and does this thing hit there? Does this thing see this? Does this thing see this? Where does it see this? And you know, you're you're you have the mental overhead of keeping it all in, uh, of keeping it all in your head. And now when you have sandcasters as limited duration terrain, yeah, if you were going, if you're going to do that, you would have to make it unidirectional. There's there's no way you would be able to model it in that way, that manner and also have it directional. And it, mm -hmm. and it, and it gets better. Because the sand has a vector. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, that you're just you're making my brain. Hurt. So <laughs> I don't see any reason to change it. I think the way that it's modeled works fine. Um, I don't have the baggage of being attached to the the setting. So that you're not going to mm -hmm. have me saying, "Well, that's not canonical," or "That's not what I'm used to." <laughs> as a game mechanic and as a means of ad introducing additional um, decision points uh, mm -hmm. works very well. I, I don't see any reason to mess with it. Yeah, and I've, I've been playing Traveler since 79, and even, even I don't consider Sand to actually be, 
big clouds of a blade of sand because how the hell would that even work? That's mm -hmm. cl clouds of clouds of <laughs> chaff, noisemakers, decoys, counter missiles, all that good, mm -hmm. all that good stuff to uh, get in the way of a good fire control solution. Mm -hmm. but, uh, not it. Yeah. Easy enough to mm -hmm. see how that would have yeah. been picked picked up uh, the in-universe name of sand, but no, it's mm -hmm. not actually sand. <laughs> <laughs> Although in the fiction that goes with this, I actually discuss that you know I actually have in the in the opening for the second for the uh, second scenario. In the first scenario, I'm actually just doing armor and no sand, uh, with the caveat being that the uh, Jodani ship that has just you know pounded a refueling dump uh, into into Chutney um, has run out of its sand and uh, the first ship that we are that, that we are shown this captain on uh, has used all of his sand because he's been on a long duration escort mission and just hasn't had chance to go and restock his missile magazines or his sand bat or his sand magazines he was in fact planning on uh, doing it at the now chutneyfied base yes uh, so that makes the first scenario really fast in terms of how quickly things die, and it's actually really it's it's a very scripted scenario. It basically says, "This is your vector. This is how much you're thrusting. These are the decisions that are going through these through these fictional captains' minds. Why they're making these decisions. This is what's happening. This these are the die rolls. This is the damage that's done." Uh, that we actually just recorded a, a live play game uh, to do that. Uh, and then tweaked it a little bit as I was writing it out to make sure we got the result we wanted. But we didn't have to tweak it that much. Uh, and because it has, uh, because the because the Zodiac has a uh, bay energy beam that goes out to range 12, uh, and the uh, frigate version of the PF Sloan has a bay particle beam that goes out to range 18 for the uh, Imperial version, there are some interesting, there's some really interesting decisions to make because the bay particle beam on that ship needs a turn of cooldown uh, before it gets its shot. Whereas the uh, Zodiac um, has another limitation on the energy beam because they're both little teeny tiny ships in this scale. One of the other amusing things on this is that this also means that I kind of defined sand in the you know fictional interlude leading up that I just referred to as the piezoelectric crystals that are held by magnetic fields. Uh, to you know, that are held by, magne ma by magnetic fields on the uh, direct line of bearing between the incoming target. <laughs> Which is canonical. It's, mm -hmm. Mark Miller would appro approve that uh, without, without the slightest quibble. I'm not sure what yep. his current thinking on sand is, but I haven't seen, any, I haven't seen anything written down uh, by by any any addition he's touched that mm -hmm. says that's not actually sand. Mind you, depending on the version of Traveler Space Combat you have, the sand is either a omnidirectional uh, version of chaff that stays with your ship for a, that stays with your ship for a turn or two. It is a mobile, or it's a mobile terrain thing that somebody has to shoot through, um, or it is a reactive defense that you pop up after you have been hit by the lasers to uh, to say, "Nope, that missed." Which, when I explain that to my local group, which has people who are, you know, in the physics department of the local university RPI causes them to go, wait, you're, you are reactively putting sand in the way of the speed of light lasers. Nah, you're, pop you're, you're just popping it out between the ranging pulse and, uh, and the one with, with all the megatools behind it. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, mechanically, that's, you've got to look at that cross-eyed. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm going to open up uh, the Imperial ships just so we can do a little bit of show and tell while we have Dan here, because Dan can actually look at these and go, wait, what? <laughs> uh, Imperial approaching finals. So this, this is a battleship, Dan. It hasn't popped up on my screen yet. Oh, there it is. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. This is a battleship. Note the note the thirty six points of sand on the front, backed up by three armor. I, I, that thing yeah, and this is, burns this is through a box and a. I'm talking about. Um, yes. <laughs> curious, not related necessarily to this design. Um, in the universe, what is a bay particle as opposed to bay energy? 
So a Bay Energy Beam is a uh, basically a fusion cannon. Uh, a Bay Particle Beam is a gigantic particle accelerator. Collimated, proton, collimated protons versus fusion byproducts. And note the that the uh, the big ship with the, the spi spinal mesom gun that was the light cruiser we just watched uh, kill stuff with has that built as a keel mount. The, the battleship has has its mesom gun as nose fixed, which gives it right. a wider arc, and we can fit two of them. Yes, I just refer to this as the under over as the under over double barrel me spinal mesan shotgun. <laughs> so it gets four shots uh -huh. and two ch two chances to get a free extra hit, hit with the chain of fire, and no cooldown. That fires mm -hmm. every turn. Okay. So stay away from this thing. Gotcha. <laughs> Yes. Point this point this end towards enemy, <laughs> and the other uh, the other amusing thing on this is that we have a Mison screen, uh, which works on a six plus. So location five. So, yep. yep. Saw that. Okay, it costs an action point. So I'm going to go and make I'm going to go and make two. Uh, you know, I'm going to go and make some uh, some Mison gun attacks with this thing. Uh, we'll say I'm firing at range, you know, 17. Uh, so I needed a 5 plus to hit. So that first Misan gun did uh, 8 points of damage uh, on that first hit, and the second hit is going to go. And on the uh, Misan screen, there are 8 points of damage. Unlike the nuclear damper, where you roll once and it makes the missile go away or not, Misan screen, you roll a batch of dice, in this case 8, and everyone that comes up as a six or a higher blocks a point of Nissan damage. So that was six rolls and three and three points of damage stopped. So the remaining eight points ignore the sand, ignore the armor, and go into hit location three. And you got a hit with the chain fire. Yep. And there's the second one coming in. And hey, I'm I, I'm being kind, and that's only six points. So let's do another <laughs> Nissan screen. Um, I should have rolled two more of them on the last one, so I'll roll them on this one. Yeah, so I got you know I'm basically blocking half the damage with this, with the uh, variability of a with the variability of a die pool that needs a six or better to hit. Uh, this is why it's called a screen rather than a damper, not only because of the usage in Traveler where it's actually called the Mison screen and the nuclear damper is called the nuclear damper, but because in Squadron Strike, uh, in Squadron Strike, screen is a, is a specified noun for super science defenses. Screens are basically roll one die for every point, for every point of damage, and uh, damper is roll one die for every weapon hit. And this way it's a little bit easier to remember because damper is it damps the entire weapon and screen means that some of it is going to filter through. <laughs> uh, what, one of the things that has caused all kinds of problems in creating, in, well, not problems per se, but one of the things that caused, how should we put this, frustration amongst myself, uh, frustration for me and frustration for my editor, is that so many people have a cognate of, nucle of nuclear damper in their head that is called a nuclear dampener. A nuclear damper is a device that prevents nuclear explosions from happening. A nuclear dampener is a moist towelette that you probably need to hand off to the radio to, to the uh, radioactive disposal disposal team. Keep these straight. <laughs> one of them helps, and one of them gets you a very stern talking to by safety and HR. You'll also notice that as the ships get bigger, uh, the pivot rating gets worse, as you would expect. Uh, the thrust rating still remains pretty high for the uh, plank well, uh, but this is just about the second largest ship in the setting, isn't it? Uh, the Tigris is bigger. Is there anything else that's bigger than a plank? Tigris is bigger. There's a uh, the, another an older dreadnought called the Kokarak, which is also at two hundred thousand, and I think the Zodani might have something at three hundred k tons. Okay, I know that the uh, Veep Shackle is two, is also two hundred. So one of the things we ended up doing with this, as we were putting it together, um, this is, and I may have lost track of a revision cycle in this. Um, so this project has effectively been cursed. 
Um, the first person who was assigned this project had a stroke. The second person who was assigned this project had a heart attack uh, that required a quadruple like bypass. Being involved in this little project right now. <laughs> uh, the third person who got involved with this project and was going to take over the lead was going to take over the lead on it had a heart attack. The fourth person who got involved with this project got stationed to Afghanistan, took all of his traveler material with him in his, you know, luggage allotments to Afghanistan, along with his uh, laptop, and before he made it to Kandahar, the Taliban did a rocket attack on the convoy carrying all of his stuff. Uh, on the convoy that was that his stuff was in. There was more than his stuff in the convoy, but a rocket attack basically obliterated all of the work that he had done. And all of his traveler materials. And left Better him in country. Drink, Dan. <laughs> what was the, what was that, Dan? <laughs> I said at some point you just got to take the hint. <laughs> uh, whenever I come up in the uh, ch chain of people who have assigned the project, I only heard about the one stroke. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think Dan is overrating my suspicious nature. <laughs> <laughs> So this project was deader than a doornail after the Taliban attack. Um, and then, uh, because he had done extensive work uh, and had done a fair bit of work that I wasn't willing to th that, that, that I wasn't willing to throw out, and it also happened at about the time that I was separating Ad Astra from Final Sword, so I didn't have time to go and redo this. That person got home, and a year after coming back home had to move apartments, and in moving his apartments, he found a couple of external hard drives that he had not realized he still owned, because, you know, they had been three years old, and he plugged one of them in, and he found about three, he found about two-thirds of his work, and said, I don't want to take any further risks. Do you have anybody else who can take this on? At which point I asked Mike. <laughs> <laughs> we were telling you the story of how this product came to be, including the... Uh, stroke the two heart attacks and the Taliban missile attack before, you know, uh, right. me carefully hiding that information from Mike so he wouldn't run away. In the process of this, uh, we had several people take slightly different versions of the Traveler Cannon as their base point for doing the designs. Uh, the first person who worked on this tried to do a straight-up linear design, a, a straight-up linear conversion. And this resulted in way too many weapons. This resulted in uh, th th this resulted in ships that didn't really move that much, because he focused on the weapons rather than the maneuver capabilities. Um, <clears throat> and then he had the stroke. <laughs> uh, then there were two people who had heart attacks who were trying to revise that design into something a little bit more playable. And then Squadron Strike 2nd Edition happened. The, the person who had the Taliban attack hit him, or hit his stuff, rather. Uh, tried to do more of a linear conversion on it and toned things down and toned things down and was really more interested in the background canonicity and he didn't really have a chance to play it. Then this got handed over to Mike, uh, who, uh, who basically cursed my name when we were trying to do block, we were trying to do sandcasters as blocks damage, uh, as a weapon trait. So sandcasters used to be these weapons that had firing arcs, and then you would uh, roll to hit with them, and if you hit, you would roll your damage, and that damage is the number of shield bubbles that you had, which was causing Mike to pull his hair out. Produces a, a, an unnecessary <laughs> amount of die rolling. Okay. A truly staggering a num a truly staggering amount of unnecessary die rolling. Uh, he also had you know, four different missile designs. Uh, for the Imperials and three different for the Jodani for different range brackets and different attack profiles, and the the sheer number of missiles that he had in the game meant that you needed to have forests of rate of fire three and four lasers. You'll notice that the banked lasers on the plank well here are the same thing as the turret laser that that you saw us using earlier, except they've got a rate of fire of three. Okay. The uh, plank well here can chuck eighteen missiles per turn. And you know, only has four rounds of only has four turns of ammunition in his uh, missile banks. Uh -huh. 
And those missiles are those missiles are a substantial threat. Notice the notice the profile numbers in the plank well. If you hit if you hit this from the top and bottom, it's got a profile number of minus three. Uh -huh. Optimized for broadside fire. And you know this is one of the things that the traveler space combat crowd is just not used to. Wait a minute, what do you mean my what do you mean my orientation actually matters? <laughs> <laughs> Isn't it just range, <laughs> long or short? Uh, but they are damage three pen nine, just like the small missile. They have raking fire three, spherical arc nuclear, which is what a lot, which is what tells us that they are uh, intercepted by the uh, nuclear damper, and they have double pen. You remember double pen, or have you seen anything that uses double penetration yet? Uh, I'm not I'm not familiar with it. I mean, I know I I know what it does, but I haven't played against it. Okay, uh, you roll two you roll two sets of penetration dice and add them together. Uh -huh. So you have a variability that goes from 0 to 18 additional points of damage. And when you hit with that thing for the 1 in 2,500 chance for 18 points of damage, you really you know, dance you, you dance a jig. <laughs> Against a heavily armored target, you're going to lose a lot of that to, to armor, but you're still going to, you're, you're still going to spread out the, uh, the pain pretty badly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what the Raking Fire 3 does on the Raking Fire 2 on the lasers... On lasers, lasers and nuclear weapons tend to hit what Highguard called surface hits, which means they don't penetrate that deep into the ship. Now, we can't really do full-on surface modeling, you know, surface feature modeling in this, but as an abstraction, uh, what Raking Fire 3 does is that everything that gets past the defenses, you break it up into groups of three and you roll an individual hit location for each one of those groups. So if I'd gotten uh, 19 points past the armor on this, I'd be rolling three, six hit locations of three and, the fi and a final hit location of one. And that's really good for stripping off the cargo and the hull and a little bit of the stuff that's deeper inside the ship. Raking Fire 2 is going to mark off a cargo box and then it's going to hit some of the component armor and not damage it. Uh, and Raking Fire 3 will hit a little bit deeper in you know, in line with what's happening with uh, High Guard. Uh, so what we did with so we we basically built a mace, we basically built uh, built a matrix of the three sizes and the six or seven families of weapons that are that there are in Traveler. Uh, and then the next layer up is the tech level on each of them. Because a tech level 15 weapon should be different from a tech level 14 weapon, which should be different from a tech level 13 weapon. And, you know, TL, what was the time of the Terran conquest of the first Imperium? What tech level was that? Tech level 11 or 12? Yeah, 11, 11 and 12 for most of the war. So this is, you know, about 1,200 years past that in the timeline. Um so there, this resulted in a lot of weapon designs, and at which point I decided that you know what, nuclear missiles are millennia old technology by this point. They should be as standardized as you know, twelve ounce hammers are. <laughs> so we put Mike's second iteration onto the table at Origins. There was not nearly enough kaboom. <laughs> okay, this looks good on paper. This does not look good on the table. Um, and then we went through about seven or eight months of iterating through various various versions of this. Mm -hmm. I think the Tigress might actually be the only unit in this universe that will actually that will get a uh, armor level of four. And if you take a look at the laser damage mm -hmm. uh, on this banked laser, a Tigress with armor level four, <laughs> I guess something armed with only lasers, yeah. kind of gets to ignore it, <laughs> which is appropriate. You know, this is one of those things that you know a battleship should be ignoring the uh, three inch, the the, the three inch anti aircraft guns. So, any other questions, or should we wrap this up? No, I think we're good. All right. Uh, any other final comments, Mike? I'm good. Thanks for thanks for uh, hang, hanging out uh, while we play, play games. Mm -hmm. Anything.